Reserves, which is a form of shared state concurrency. Before we start, a few seconds of respect for the Ukrainians who are fighting for their freedom and for our freedom. Okay, today I'm going to talk about an extension of locks, monitors, and monitors are used when we want threads to collaborate, to work together. I'll start, I give you some intuition, then I give you the semantics. Monitors have three operations, wait, notify, notify all. Then I'll show you an example, a bounded buffer. So again, we go to the bounded buffer. This one is not declarative. You can call it for multiple threads, non-deterministically. I show you how to implement it with the monitor. And I also show you a small variation, a buggy version. And it's really interesting to see why this buggy version is buggy. To show you why monitors are a little bit tricky. Okay. And after that, this will teach us a programming pattern. Monitors, you have to use them in certain ways to make sure they're correct because of the problems of the interleavings. And this is the most useful pattern for monitors. I showed you a book, Concurrent Programming in Java, by Dudley, which is all about programming with monitors and has shown you many other kinds of possibilities. But by far the most useful pattern is this one, the one I'm going to show you. And then I will end by showing you how the monitors are implemented. This is starting with our reentrant lock. We go further. We separate the entry and the exit. So it calls it get release lock. I add a queue. This is for the wait set in the monitor. And then I show you the code. And I'll explain a bit how it works, but I won't prove that it's correct. Okay. Okay, definition of monitors. So a monitor is a lock. Okay, it's a lock with extra operations. And the use is when you have data abstraction, like a buffer, queue, database, whatever, and you have multiple threads accessing it. And somehow they have to coordinate these threads. Uh -huh. Like you put an element in the queue, and you can only take an element out when there's an element in, and so on. Locks are not enough, okay? If you just have locks, you can't do it. So here's an example. Let's say we have a bounded buffer, okay? It has n five spaces inside. You can put five elements and take five elements out. And you can protect that with a lock. Okay, fine. And many threads can access it. But that's not going to work. Huh? What happens if a thread wants to put an element in the buffer and the buffer is full? Has five, all five slots are full. Well, the lock is not going to solve that. Because sure, you get in. The lock is just guaranteeing that the buffer code is, in, is, is running only on one thread at a time. But we need something more. If you want to put an element in the buffer, and the buffer is full, you, you can't do it. You cannot do it. And usually, well, you can, you can make an error, an exception, but that's not really how you use bounded buffers. What you want to do is wait. Wait until another thread takes an element out, okay? And then you can, the thread that wants to put the element in can go on. So you see there's like a coordination between the two threads. And in the other direction too. Let's say if a thread wants to take an element out, remove an element, and the buffer is empty. Well, you could raise an exception, but that's not the way buffers are supposed to be used. That's a normal up thing for a buffer. Right? It's not exceptional. What you have to do is wait until another thread puts an element in. So you see, you have threads putting elements in and threads taking elements out. And they coordinate. Sometimes they have to wait. So we say the threads are coordinating. Okay. 
So you cannot do that with just locks, because locks will only manage the, the atomic execution. They will not handle the waiting if the buffer is full. Okay, so you need something more. So monitors is the thing, and they were introduced or invented by Per Brink Hansen in 1972, 50 years old already, and they were essentially turned into the modern form by Tony Hoare, who's a, these, both of these are famous computer scientists in 1974. So this is a long time ago. Okay, so they're old things. It seems a lot of things happened around this time. Huh? Multi-agent programming was also invented around this time. Functional programming was also invented around this time. Deterministic data flow was also invented around this time. So around 10 years, around 1970, was a really interesting time for concepts in computer science. Some of those concepts, they are good and they survive and they are the ones we need. Multi-agent, deterministic data flow. Some of them are not the right ones. And monitor is kind of one that's not the right one. We know that, but it's still used a lot today because many very popular languages use it. For example, Java, like in the book Concurrent Programming in Java. And if you want to do reliable programming, the same kind of reliability as Erlang, it's much harder to do that in Java, okay? Which you can see if you look how they do it in the book. But it's still widely used. But today, people are going away from monitors, okay? But still, I have to show them to you, and I will explain exactly how they work. Okay, so monitor is a lock, but it has two extra operations called wait and notify. And it has internally an extra data structure called a wait set. So that's, that's basically how it extends the lock, okay? So a wait set is a set of suspended threads. So the monitor can force threads to wait, to suspend, and it can wake them up. And it can put those suspended threads while they're waiting in this data structure. So this is an interesting data structure because what it contains is threads, okay? Suspended threads. And the wait set is managed using wait and notify operations. Okay, so wait and notify are the way that the threads kind of signal, talk to each other, okay? One important thing is that it's still a lock. And wait and notify, you have to do them inside the lock. These are operations that you do when you're inside the lock and not outside. So always the wait and notify are done inside. Very important, okay? Okay, so how does it work? <coughs> Okay, well, intuitively, the weight puts a thread in the weight set. Okay, when the thread calls weight, it is suspended and put in the weight set. And then the lock is released. So you leave, it leaves the lock. Huh? When it's in the weight set, otherwise it would be dead lock. Huh? It releases the lock so another thread can take the lock. So that's the weight. It goes into the weight set and notify. When a thread calls notify, it will wake up one of the threads in the wait set. Any one, okay? But the thread that's calling notify just keeps going. Huh? But it wakes up one of the threads in the wait set. And that thread that's woken up, of course, what does a thread do when it's woken up? It starts running and it tries to get the lock again. Okay, so the wait is executing somewhere inside the lock, and when the thread is waiting, it's in the wait set, and when it wakes up, it tries to keep going where it stopped. So it tries to get the lock again, of course, at the place where it was suspended. So that's basically how it works. Okay, let me make it very precise now. So I'm going to give you the Java semantics because this one is 
simple, it's also very popular. There's many variations of this, okay? But the Java semantics is a nice one, so I will give it to you. Let me draw some pictures here. So here I have a thread executing, so time goes down. So it's executing and it gets the log. Okay, it keeps going. Eventually it does await. Well, it then releases the lock and it goes into the wait set. Huh? Okay. And it's sitting there. And that's what happens then. If then T2, another thread, so the lock is released, this one gets the lock. Okay, and let's say it's, it doesn't notify. Okay, and then it keeps going and eventually it releases a lock. Okay, so what happens? This notify will wake up a thread in the wait set. That thread will get the lock again, try to get the lock again, huh? and when it gets succeeds, it executes where, where at the point the wait stops. And it keeps going until it releases. So you see how it works? This, is, this looks quite simple, but actually, if you look exactly what happens, it's a little bit subtle. So let's say T1 is in the wait set. Okay. T2 does notify. Okay, like there. T1 then leaves the wait set. Okay, tries to get the lock. But it won't get it right away. Why not? I know it won't get it because T2 is still inside. Okay? T2 is still inside. And then T2 eventually releases the lock. Okay? And then the lock is free, and now T1 can get the lock. So you see how it works, okay? Now there's a, an interesting point here. T1 gets the lock, but after T2 releases the lock, it's not guaranteed that T1, maybe there's another thread, T3, that tries to get the lock, huh? Okay, T1 gets the lock, but in fact when T2 wakes up T1, and T1 tries to get the lock, it's not guaranteed that T1 will get the lock. Some thread, maybe T3, when this lock is released, Maybe, and this lock is released here, maybe T3 gets the lock. But if there's no T3, then it will be T1. Okay? So this shows you the little dance that goes on between the, the threads and the notify and the weight. Okay? Okay, let me recapitulate. This is now the Java semantics. So when you start programming in Java, it will be very familiar. You have actually three operations. Wait, notify, and a third one, a third one called notify all, which I'll explain, which is just a little small extension of notify. So the wait will do three operations in order. It suspends the current thread at the place there when you put through the wait. It puts the thread in the wait set. And then it releases the lock. So the thread is in the wait set, suspended, and the lock is free. Okay? And when the thread is woken up later, removed from the wait set and woken up, it tries to get the lock again, and it will keep running exactly at the set part where it was waiting. Okay? So the wait is just like a temporary stop there. So that's wait. Notify. If the wait set is non-empty, it takes an arbitrary thread, 
maybe there's more than one, but the weight set removes it and wakes it up. And that thread then resumes execution, as I show in the diagram, okay? That thread T will try to get the lock like any other thread. Notice T will always suspend again briefly. Here the T is the T1 here. It tries to get the lock, but since the T2, which did the notify, is still inside the lock, T1 will always suspend for a short time, for sure. Usually this is at near the end. So usually the notify is done very close to the, the release, so T1 does not have to suspend very much. Okay? So that can seem kind of complicated, and it is kind of complicated. But we can use it to write, uh, to make programs with multiple threads, okay? So, let me show you now the notify all. Uh, notify wakes up one of the threads in the wake set, but that's kind of a problem sometimes. So this is semantically very clean, okay? One thread. But maybe there's multiple threads, and that's not the right one somehow for the application. So usually, there's, the notify is not used. Uh, it's, it's defined because of reasons of simplicity. But usually, there's another operation called notify all. So basically, it's very simple. You notify for all the threads in the wait set. You wake them all up. So if there's 100 threads in there, they're all woken up, and they all try to get the lock, okay? You can see it's kind of messy, but that is, is the thing you will make. If you do that, you're guaranteed that the thread that you want to wake up is woken up. So the weight set becomes empty after that, huh? It's emptied, all the threads are resumed, they all try to get the lock. Of course, only one is going to get it. The others will keep waiting. So one thread will get the lock. And if that's not the one you want, let's say you're doing puts in a buffer, and the buffer is full. And you have a hundred puts in the weight set, all waiting, and one get. Okay? So, uh, arrives. So the get does notify. A hundred puts are woken up. And, uh, they all try to get the lock. The first one, the lucky one that gets locked, will uh, do, will, uh, so the get has emptied the slot. Eh? That first put will be able to put an element, and the, hundred, the 99 other threads will just go to sleep again. So you see it's kind of overhead uh, to do that. So this is called contention, where all the threads are kind of Fighting. They're not really fighting, but one of them is lucky, the others are not lucky. Okay. So this can be a problem if you have lots of threads. And but usually there's not that many, hopefully. So it's not really a problem. It's only a small percentage of the time. But you can fix it. So there's extensions of monitors where you can have multiple weight set. Uh, for example, in the bounded buffer, you do put and get. But in Java, every synchronized object has only one weight set. Well, you could have two. You could have a weight set of the threads that are trying to do a put, and another weight set of the threads trying to do a get. And some versions of monitors have multiple weight sets. Okay, But that's not how Java does it. And, and you could simulate that in Java by having multiple synchronized objects, okay? But that it starts getting more complicated. So that's all that to avoid contention, okay? So you see how, theoretically, how it works, huh? Okay, now let's run, write some application with that. What I want to show you now is the, our good old bounded buffer. This time, it's not declarative bounded buffer. So remember, we did already a declarative bounded buffer where there's always one thread putting elements in and another thread taking them out. So that's like a pipeline, huh? 
A declarative bounded buffer is what, like a Unix pipe, huh? which is always getting from one place and, and going to one place. But you could have a more general bounded buffer where multiple threads are putting elements in, and maybe multiple elements are, threads are taking elements out. Okay? So this is the more general one. So this one will be non-deterministic. Huh? If you have two threads doing put, then it, the scheduler decides who does it first. Okay? So the bounded buffer has a, a, a size, a maximum number of elements, like 10 here. And it has two operations, put and get. And it also has a, a creation operation. So we'll have a, 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 we'll make it like an object. So a buffer will be like a class. And B is the buffer object. So this B, do buffer in it and creates a buffer of size N. And you have two operations, put X and get X. When you call the put x, it just puts x in the buffer. If the buffer is full, this operation will wait. It will wait until, until there's room in the buffer. And the other operation is get. And this one will remove an element from the buffer and bind it to x. And if the buffer is empty, it waits again. Okay? So it's very intuitive huh? until there's at least one element. So these can be done by multiple threads. So you see there's kind of interaction between the threads. Huh? So the monitors is going to be inside there, and it's going to make sure that everything works right. Yeah. OK, so, how, so that's kind of the specification. So we'll implement it like this. We'll have an array of size n, but organized like a ring, OK, from 0 to n minus 1. But if you keep going past n minus 1, you go back to 0. So there's a wraparound. And we have two pointers, two indices, first and last. The first points to the first element. And then you keep going. And last points to the first empty slot after the last element. Okay. So here, for example, A, B, C, D is in the buffer. And here's a free slot. The last is pointing to. To remove an element, you <coughs> take the element that's under first, and then you increment first. So the first moves like this. To add an element, you put the element here at the right neck where the last is pointing to, and then you increment last. So you see, first and last are going to be like going round and round. If the if the index goes outside of the range. 0 and minus 1, it is replaced by a modulo operation. Okay? The number of elements is going to be last minus first. So here it's 4. Huh? Last minus first will always be the number of elements. Okay? Notice there's a problem. If you have 0 elements, then last and first are pointing to the same place. Okay? If you have n elements, Okay, then again, they're pointing to the same place. So you have to keep track of the number of elements. And if it's empty, if the put or the get would make the buffer negative size or bigger than n, then the operation is blocked. Okay? Sorry, this has to be n, I think, not n minus 1. Okay? So that's how it works. You have these two numbers going round and round, and you have also this, the, uh, the number of elements in the buffer. Okay? So here's the code. So this is the OS class notation. So we used it already before. I also defined an array. This we did already before with uh, Flavius Josephus. So I'm not going to really explain what happened? So we have global attributes, buff, first, last, n, and i. So buff is an array, go from 0 to n minus 1. First and last are the two indices. n is a constant, which is the number of elements. And i is how many elements are in the buffer, okay? How many elements are actually in. And we have two methods, put 
and get it. Okay, so here's how it works then. Very simple. To put an element in the buffer, you put it in the, so the dot operation will index the array. The, you read the last, so this is the <coughs> index. So the buffer dot last gets x. So that means you put the element in, you increment last mod n. So the last is moving around like that. And you just add one to the size. Okay? Now you can do this if, if i is less than n. So you have to wait until i is less than n. Now the monitor is going to arrange for that. Huh? So I, so far I won't show you. This is just the operation. And the get is doing the opposite. Again, you have to wait. You wait until i is greater than 0. So the monitor is going to do that. You remove an element, so the what is underneath the first, so x is bound to the index underneath the first, you increment the first, and i gets i minus one. Okay? So that's pretty standard, right? Huh? Now the trick is you have to use monitors because I have multiple stateful operations here. I have two assignments, I have a bunch of reads, so I have to put this inside a lock. Huh? You, you, you totally need a lock here. Huh? You have multiple stateful operations. You want to make a big atomic action. Huh? There and there. That's reasonable. Huh? Okay. So, how do we do that? Now we, let's add the monitor. So we define a monitor abstraction. So this is how we will define it in, our, in the OS code. You have to create, you can create instances of monitors because each monitor is its own lock and has its own weight set. It's like locks, huh? you create them when you need them. So the buffer needs a monitor. We have the, we define an operation called new monitor, which creates M, which is a monitor. And M is a record and it has one, two, three, four operations. So you know the lock, it's a lock. So you have blow off just like before the lock. But you have also these four extra operations. Wait, notify, and notify all. Okay, so it's a record with four elements. The lock is like before, it's a re-entering lock. M dot lock, and you have here the statement, okay, protecting the statement with the lock. So that's just a regular old re-entering lock. Then you have the M dot wait, M dot notify, M dot notify all. Okay, so these three operations, okay, have to be done inside the lock. Okay? It's an error to do them outside. Okay, you have to do them inside. Okay, so that's very nice. Now let's write some code here. Okay, so it's. This is the code that I'm going to write. I'll explain to you how it works. It's a little bit <coughs> tricky, and I'll explain that. So I add another, another attribute M. I create the monitor here, M. And now the way, the code, I add the red part here. So first of all, I have the lock. So procedure, this is all a procedure with a statement that I'm protecting. Yeah? So the red part plus this, it's all protected. And now I, I have to wait until i is less than n. So what, how do I do that? If i is bigger, greater than or equal to n, then I wait. Okay? And then the thread will wait here. Eventually, some other thread will do a get, and it will cause this one to wake up right here. And it will continue. Okay, so what do we do? We try again. And the way to try again is to do another put x. We try again to do put x. So this is the correct way to do it. When you wait, you basically call put again. You try again. Okay? Now, if i is less than n, then, then you're good. Then there's room in the buffer. And you do this, and you do notify all at the very end. 
this will tell the other threads to wake up. So you might have other threads trying to do gets or puts. The puts, you're not helping them, but the, the gets will be very happy. They will wake up and one of them will succeed. The others will go back to sleep, okay? So one of them will succeed and uh, so the way the get has a similar code, uh, it waits until i is greater than zero. Okay, so let me now run this. succeeds, it will do end for them. So now let's put ABC. It is display triforth. 
So this is actually, when I feed this, it creates a thread. And uh, in that thread, I have this sequence of instructions. And the three puts are going to work here, A, B, C, but the D is going to wait. Okay? So what happens now if I do a get? So if I do one get here, what's going to be displayed? You tell me. If I do this, what's going to be displayed? And four. So it's a buffer, huh? So the first element you put in is the first one that comes out. So what is displayed? Sorry? It's going to say and fourth, and what else? Uh, B. B. Why B? I think so. Because they, we didn't. Okay, the, the, the first A. Oh, it was we put in another A, huh? Okay, the A now. So, uh, so we A. Okay, so that's a good, so you'll have A and N fourth. In what order will they be displayed, the A and the N fourth? So here I have a thread doing get X, browse X, so this will display A, and then this one will actually continue and do N fourth. In what order will the N fourth and the A be displayed? What do you think? So they're running in separate threads, huh? Depends. Sorry? It depends. It depends, exactly. It depends on the scheduler. Probably, you can, you, can, you can say, you can probably estimate what is the one that's going to happen the most likely, but uh, both solutions are possible. Huh? So if I run this, it will say A and fourth. Okay. And I can do again. Yeah, no. If I do another one, B after get, and do another one, C after get. If I do another one now, what's going to happen? If I now I display A B C. If I do this again, what's going to be displayed? I did this, huh? If I do now and this now, what am I going to display? For simple question, huh? Yeah? D after get. D after get. Yeah, I think that's right. D after get. D after get. And if I run this again, now, once more, what's going to be displayed? Nothing. Nothing. That is, I think, correct. Nothing is, dis sorry, nothing is displayed here. But I ran this, huh? And now, let me do put F. And what will happen if I do put F? So here, this, this get is, is suspended, huh? So this thread here, it's suspended here, huh? So when I do put F, what's going to happen? It's going to get F out. It's going to get F out. Exactly. So it's going to display F and F to get, huh? F, F to get. It's nice, huh? It's a beautiful concurrent program, right? Okay. So that's good. Let me go back to the slides. Because, um, oh, sorry, before going back to the slides, let me show you the code for, <coughs> for the get, which I didn't show you before. I didn't show it to you on the slide, huh? So this is the code, the code for the get. I have a lock. This is the statement that's protected. If I equals zero, so the buffer is empty, then wait, and I try again, okay, when the wait comes back. Else, I remove one element and I do notify that. So it's very similar to the put, huh? Okay. So there you see all the code. But now, now I want to 
do a little bit more. I want to do a little bit. I want to. So this works. But maybe you don't really, maybe, or maybe you do understand exactly why this one works. Because I'm going to show you a variation of that. Here's a variation, which is buggy. Okay, so here's a variation. I have another, another version of the block here. If i is greater than equal to 10, so if the buffer is full weight, but when I do notify, this one wakes up and it continues. So this is buggy. So the question for you is, tell me, explain why it's buggy. Find a scenario that is, shows me why it's buggy. So the difference, just to be very clear, the difference between the preceding one, when the weight returns, it tries again to do a put. Doesn't mean you know, here, it tries again to do a put. And that is correct. This version, when the weight returns, it immediately does the buffer operations here, and then notify all. So this is buggy. Why is it buggy? Yeah? Um, because we expect a thread that is our waiting, the hook um, can uh, enter at the same time. So where exactly, if multiple threads uh, are waiting in the if condition? Wait, if condition doesn't wait, huh? Uh, there, there, there is an M wait. Okay, I, you, I, you've, I think you're on the right track, but you have to be very precise. If this thread is wake, wakes up, it tries to get the lock. Now that's the first thing. The thread, when you move it where the wake says, it tries to get the lock. And when it gets the lock, it does this. So why is that wrong? Because we keep a thread and get the lock at the same time. Well, they can be waiting for the lock. They can't get the lock at the same time, huh? Just to be very precise. I think you understand the problem, but you have to be very precise in explaining. So when this this one wakes up, it tries to get the lock. But maybe there are already other threads trying to get the lock. So maybe there's another put operation, uh, this is known by Allah, another put operation that wants to get the lock. So when this one wakes up, it tries to get the lock, but there might be other threads trying to get the lock. And if another thread succeeds in getting it before this one, that other thread will do a put, and the buffer will be full again. And then this one will get the lock, and it will do this, and, you, and the buffer is full, so that's buggy. Okay? So the problem is that when you wake up, by the, between the time you wake up and you get the lock, other threads might get in. It's not atomic. Between here and here, it's not atomic. Other threads might get in, and then when you reach here, the condition the, that the buffer is not full is not true anymore. So you, you can't do like that, okay? So that's important to understand that, huh? Okay, in this one, so this one, it, look what happens here. If, if the buffer, so I'm in, I go here, I'm in the lock, I make the test. Now if I is less than n, I do the else part. And then I start executing this. But I'm in the lock. So if i is less than n, it will still be less than n here. No other thread can get in between because I'm already in the lock. That means before doing the operations, I always have to do the test again. But if I do a wait and I wake up, and then I get the lock again, and then I do, I have to do a put x, this put x will do again the test. You have to do the test again. Because another thread might get in before you when you wake up. Okay? So that means 
you can only do the put operation directly after this test fails. Okay? Because then you guarantee no other thread will get in. You see that? So, you see it's a little bit subtle. So you have to be very, it has to be very, very clear why, why this one does not work. And you, you should be able to make a, a precise scenario with threads and scheduler choices, wake, sleep, where this thing turns into a bug. Where you, this thing will try to do a put when the buffer is already full. Okay? Which is not, which is totally incorrect. Huh? It will do it, and in fact it will do an exception because the arrayness will not have, uh, so no, the I will be too big. No, you will overwrite one of the elements of the buffer if you do that. Huh? Okay? So that's just an example of trickiness with the, with the monitors, okay? Okay, let me make a break now, and then we'll talk about uh, programming patterns, and I'll also explain how the, 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 the monitors are implemented, okay? Continue now. Before the break, we saw how to do a uh, mounted buffer with monitors and how you have to be very clear that the condition is still true when you do the code, which means that you have to try the condition to test it again when you're inside the lock. Okay, so now I want to show you a few things. First, a programming pattern to use monitors. So if you see this code here, this is a, a way that is correct, and this will you work for any kind of uh, abstraction. So we can kind of turn that into a programming pattern. And there's two ways that I can show the pattern. One of them is using a while loop, and the other one, which is equivalent, is using recursion. Okay, Taylor recursion and while loops are equivalent. As you know, they're just syntactic variation. So here's a, a, the pattern using a while loop. And I'm going to have a little bit of syntactic sugar. So I have a lock here. This is the monitor lock. While not expression, do wait. It cannot be an if. It has to be a while statement. Because when you wait here, when this one wakes up, it's inside the while loop. And before executing statement, it will check the truth of the expression again, okay? That means this expression is guaranteed to be checked when I'm in the lock. So this has to be a while loop and not an if, okay? So one not expression do wait, then the statement that's inside, and then the notify all at the end, okay? And this is equivalent to the Taylor recursive one, if not expression, then wait, self, and I try again, okay? So this is basically a recursive call to the method. So this is equivalent to the, to the while loop, okay? And you know, OS does not have while loops. It's very interesting. The language has no while loops. So the, I showed you the solution using recursion, and it's very logical. You have to, after, when you wake up, you have to try again the full method. And this one will try again, including the, the test. Huh? Since it's re-entered lock, when you get into the lock here, this one will already be in. Huh? So you're doing this test again before you do the statement in the lock. Okay. So the point is, before doing the statement, you have to do the test of the expression. And it has to be in the same lock, no gap. Okay? So the pattern will guarantee that. Uh, that means if you use the wait and the notify in this way or this way, you're guaranteed that it will be correct. Okay? You see that? So that's the, the simple pattern. There's more complicated 
ways of using monitors. This is in, uh, you can see that there's many books explaining that, but uh, I don't recommend writing applications in that way if you can avoid it. Unfortunately, people might ask you to extend or debug an existing application. Uh -huh. so, so that's why I'm explaining a lot of monitors. Okay, let me now explain how the monitors are implemented. This is an extension. Again, remember we went from the simple lock to the re-entrant lock, and now we go to the monitor, which extends again the concept of lock. Uh, next week we'll do another extension. Huh? We'll go from re-entrant lock to transaction, where you can do abort and uh, commit. So that's another extension. Huh? But now we'll show monitors. And there's basically two extensions. So it's important to understand the implementation. Huh? I will explain as much as, I, as far as I can the implementation, and it's important for you to understand really how it works. Uh, the first thing is the lock, it's still re-entrant, but it's called a get release lock. Because going in and going out will now be separate operations. Uh, in the previous one, you had you enter the critical section, you do the instruction, and then you leave. And that's one like block of code. But now you have a new thing. In the wait, you can do wait anytime. And in the wait, you have to release the lock, go into the wait set, and then try to get the lock again. So the, the releasing the lock and the getting the lock are separate operations now that you can call any time. So we split them out. So the lock is kind of separated into a get and a release operation. Uh, so I'll show you the code. But it's otherwise it's still exactly the same reentrant lock as we saw before. It's just a get and release are separate. That's the first thing. The second thing is the wait set. So we need a, a data structure, and I will use a queue to do this. So semantically, this is a set, so there's no order. But practically, it's good to make a queue, because that makes, means that the threads that are waiting the longest will be released first. So that adds some fairness. Uh, if you would do a stack here, then you could have starvation. Because if new threads were coming in, the old ones would never be, uh, maybe never be woken up, okay? So the queue ensures fairness, okay? It's not possible for thread to stay forever while other threads are leaving, okay? And it's very similar to the queue we saw before. It has a couple of extra operations. Delete all because of the notify. Okay, also a size operation and a non-blocking delete, which is important for the notif so for notify. So this one for notify all, and this one for notify. Okay, so let me show you the, the get release lock. So remember we had two things, getting in and doing the instruction and leaving. But now we separate them. We have get lock and release lock. The get lock is very similar to before. So first of all, we have the, the exchange, the wait, and we have also this current thread for the re-entrancy. Okay, and this part is I'm getting in. I actually am doing the work to enter the lock, and so this one returns true. So get lock is a function. It returns true if it actually had to do work to get in. If it's already in, then it returns false, okay? Because once you're in, it's re-entrant. So if you do a get lock again, you don't have to do any of this. So then in that case, it returns false. And then you do the, the, the operations, and then at the end, you do release lock. So the release lock is the leaving the critical section. Basically, you have to pass the token. But the token is this variable new. So how do you pass this variable new between these two functions? 
<coughs> on this variable nu here? Well, because the release log can be called anywhere, it's called the weight, which can be anywhere in the code of the function, of the procedure in the middle, sorry. So uh, you can't just put a variable there. So what we do is we, we use another cell for that. Okay, so this new variable, the variable is stored in a cell, token two, and then here I, I get the variable, so this is the variable new that corresponds to the get log, and I bind it to unit. So this is passing the token to the next guy, yeah? because the next guy is waiting on the new. Now whenever you do an exchange, each thread that's waiting gets a new variable that it waits on, and when you bind that variable to unit, unit was just a constant, then the thread can continue. So this is passing the token. So we need an extra thread, an extra cell for this, huh? Okay, see that? See how it works? So basically that's it. We need to separate those two. And then I'll show you how it works. I'll show you then in a minute how the, the weight is implemented. So the queue is very similar to the queue we saw before. So I'm using the queue with the with a difference list, but and it actually has its own little lock here, which is kind of funny. Uh, has its own little lock, uh, which is the standard reentrant lock. But probably you, you could rewrite it to not need that. But uh, it's nice to put that here. So we have insert and delete which are the same as before. But then we have three new functions, the size, the delete all, and the delete non-blocking. So the delete all, basically, it, it accesses the queue, the difference is SE, and it makes the queue empty. So delete all empties the way it's that. So 0xx is an empty queue. And then it binds E to nil, and S will then be the full list. Huh? So the difference list, to make it a, a standard list, you have to bind the end to nil. So this returns all of them, the threads. We'll see in a minute how, how threads are stored in the queue. And the delete non-blocking, this one is used for notify. Okay. So this also returns a list of threads but only one. So if the size is greater than zero, it will return a list with only one deleted element. Huh? So this is a delete here, will return a single thread. Now it's actually an unknown variable. It will return that in, the, in a list. So if the size is greater than zero, otherwise it's nil. So the, the notify, if there's no thread in the way set, the notify does nothing, huh? okay? So the queue has then this, a couple of extra operations. And then the monitor code itself looks like this. So basically I have a queue and I have a get release lock. And the lock, this is the lock like before. If get, then try p finally release. Okay, this is exactly the reentry lock we did before. If this returns true, if this function returns true, then uh, then I did work to get in. Okay, and and that means I have to do a release to get out. If this function returns false, then I'm already in, so I can execute P right away. And then you have wait, notify, and notify all. So the wait is a very interesting one. Okay, so the wait has to suspend the thread, now has to release the lock, suspend the thread, and then it, when it's waking up, try to get the lock again. So how do I suspend put a suspended thread inside, inside a, a queue. Well, I, I have a, an, an, a variable x, 
and this one will cause the thread to suspend. So I define an unbound variable, which I put in the queue, I release the lock here, then I do a wait x. So this will suspend, okay? This will suspend until the notify, which we'll see later. And then when it continues, so when it wakes up, this wait will continue, and then it will do the get, okay? So here, the get, uh, I don't care what the value is for the get, okay? So that's what I don't care. Uh -huh. So there's, there's nothing, I don't care whether it's true or false, because I know it's going to be false, actually. Yeah? Okay, because I'm in, because the weight is always done inside the log. Okay? Or no, um, no, no, that's not true, sorry. Skip that. I leave the lock, uh, and um, this one may actually do work again to try to get in, okay? And then the notify and the notify all. So the notify will remove one thread, so it's one variable, and if there is, or nothing. So if there's a variable, it binds to unit. And this causes the wait to start running again, huh? You see that? So this causes it to start running. And the notify L does the same thing for all of them. So L is a list of all the unbound variables. And for X and L, it does X equal unit. So all of them will start, will wake up again, okay? Because each of the weights has its own thread, huh? So that's how, that's how it works. Okay, so you see, you see that? And let me show you the, the actual code. Let me show it to you here. It's slightly different, but basically the same, just very minor differences. So the get here, the release lock, so again a second uh, cell for the variable new. The lock is just doing get lock and release lock. The wait will do a release lock, wait x, and then a, a get lock afterwards. So it's in a sense doing it in the opposite direction, right? Release and then it gets, and then the notify and then notify all. Okay. Here I'm using for all. There's a procedure called for all that executes this procedure for all elements of the list. So it's small differences, but it's essentially the same code. Huh? So this is the actual code that runs. So I'm not hiding anything. Okay. okay. So now we get to the end of what I wanted to say about monitors. So monitors are extending locks, just to give a summary. It has a wait set and wait and notify operations. The wait set is the set of suspended threads and it's kind of tricky to use because you have to be very careful when you are getting the lock and when the condition is true, that it has to be true in the abstraction. So monitors are hard to program unless you use a pattern. So I showed you the pattern. And widely used in legacy code. Okay. But I don't recommend it for new code. And next week we will see transactions. Okay. Let me, since we're a little bit early, I will show you a small introduction to this and then we will stop for today. That's all I wanted to say about monitors. I could spend more time, but don't really want to. Okay. Let me just give a very brief introduction to transactions now. So now we then we finish the part of shared state on, on uh, monitors.
So you see how they work, and you see everything, you see the implementation, and uh, everything else is built on top of that. Huh? But that's all I wanted to say about monitors. Action, transactions are much more important than monitors. Transactions are a very good thing. So I will give you a small introduction to transactions, and then we stop early today. But I want to already prime your, your thinking for transactions. Okay, so now we switch, now we talk to transactions. So transactions are used for databases. And so they're used all over the place. And they will keep being used, okay, for critical information high performance, scalability, and fault tolerance, resilience, okay? So let me give you just a simple motivating example, and then we stop today. So here's the database, uh, a large array of cells, basically, yeah? Huh? So here, it's not very big, it's only 1,000, but you have millions, and there's a lock. And this database has all the information on your bank account. And I want to transfer money from one account to the other. Huh? And other clients want to do the same thing. So there's lots of concurrent updates to this. So how do we implement this? Well, it's very easy. We have the lock. So we, I get the lock, I do the transfer, and then I release the lock. So we can use one lock to protect the whole array. It's perfectly correct. But it's very slow. Because what if this guy wants to transfer, and this guy wants to transfer, and this guy, and all three of them want to do it at the same time? Well, they all have to get the lock. So they have to serialize. So it's very slow. OK? So that's not the way we really implement this. Uh, even though it's correct, it's much too slow. So the real database, it has one lock per cell. Okay? So let's say I want to do a transfer. Okay? From one to two. Uh, T1, tra transaction T1. I want to move money from T1 to two. Well, I can get the, I get those two locks. And I know that, that nobody else will touch those two cells, and I transfer. Okay? And let's say I have another one that does from two to three. Transfer money from three to two, for example. Again, I have to get the two locks, these two then, to do the transfer. But be careful, we have concurrent program here. Okay? What if the updates are done in the wrong order, okay? So, uh, here, so the example here is when you don't have the locks. But to lock them, if I lock, I get the locks one after the other. Getting locks is not atomic, okay? So I have to be very careful. If I get this lock, and then the other one gets this lock, the T2, and then T2 gets this lock and writes and releases, and this one gets the lock and writes. I can have overlap and money can disappear. Okay? So I need a clever way of managing all these locks. And that is what transactions provide to you. Okay? So the, the condition is. You want, first of all, large atomic actions. So every transaction has to be one atomic action. The th second thing is, this is a database stored on a disk. So we add robustness to this. And the database is stored permanently on the disk. Okay. And so how do we ensure that there's no corruption when we write things to the disk? Okay, well, uh, because the disk can crash at any time, and when we reboot the system, the data has to be consistent. Well, you're writing many things on the disk, so how do you do that? 
When I do a transaction from 2 to 3, I will write 2 and I will write 3. So I'm doing two writes. What if there's a crash in the middle? Okay. Well, the way it's done is that all the writes for a transaction are stored on one place in the disk. And when it's all done, a single word is written to switch the content from the old to new value. And the only thing the disk has to satisfy is <coughs> single word write must be atomic. And that is what the hardware satisfied. If there is a crash before one word write, then when the system reboots, you see get the old value back. Okay? If there is a crash after the one word write, you will see, when it reboots, you will see the new value. And you will never see anything else. Okay? So that is how you can guarantee that it's consistent even if you have a crash anytime. And finally, you can have action, actions, transactions executing in parallel. Okay? And that's where you need to handle. Uh, let me show you. One more thing, and then we're done for today, just to get you into it. Okay, let's say you have two transactions that are updating money, and so they need two cells. Transaction T1, it locks the cell, first cell with L1, it gets the data and releases the lock, and then it locks T2 and gets the data and writes the data. But what if there's a transaction T2 that is executing in the middle? It locks T1, L, uh, C1, C2, it does an update of L1, and then this one does an update of L2, and the data is inconsistent. Okay, so that means the way you manage the locks has to be very smart. Okay, and today I just give you a little bit of intuition. You need, you cannot just manage locks in any old way. You have to do them in a very smart way that it's still atomic. It's basically what is called serializability. That means the transactions are atomic. Okay. So we have to have some kind of a discipline how we manage the locks. For example, T1 will get both of its locks, do the work, then release. T2 will get both of its locks, do the work, and then release. Okay? And if we do this, then you won't see the money disappear. Okay? Okay, so let me stop there for today. I think we're, we're a little bit early. But that's okay. So you have seen monitors. I will put the code for the, the, the buffer and the monitor on the, the Moodle. So please run that code and make sure you understand how it's working. Okay. And so that's it for today. So that's all. You will now understand monitors. Next week I will present transactions, but I will also give you kind of overview of the whole course and also explain little kinds of things I will expect from you for the exam. Okay, So we'll stop now today uh, a little bit earlier.